Hello, big news from our friends over at DistroKid. They now have an app. This app works on iOS and Android, of course. And it's available in the Apple Store and Google Play Stores and all the stores where you buy apps. Go check it out. It's got a lot of cool features. You can upload new releases. You can get notified when you've earned royalties. Awesome. You can withdraw from the app via push notifications. A little dangerous for me, but rad. Anyways, go check it out. It's all at distrokid.com slash app. And don't forget, you can still get 30% off your DistroKid account by going to distrokid.com slash VIP slash tour stories. Have a great one. We would like to celebrate our friends and supporters over at isotope.com. Find makers of audio software for repair, mixing, and mastering. You know their goods. RX-10, Neutron 4, Ozone 11, Nectar 4. Chris and I love them. We use them. And we know you'll love them too. And right now, they're having a New Year's sale on many of their software bundles. Go to isotope.com and check it all out. And use code RUIN10 when you check out to get your discount. Again, it's I-Z-O-T-O-P-E dot com. And enjoy. Vera, what's happening? Not much. How are you doing? I'm good. Where are you? I'm in bed in Los Angeles. In bed actually. in Los Angeles. Do you live there? I do. I live in L.A. Yeah. Are you a Los Angelino kind of grow up there kind of person? I was born out here, but then I grew up between New York City and Canada. Mm. My dad's Canadian and um, hardcore, hardcore Canadian, like woods, <laughs> woods <laughs> kind oh. of thing. And so... Um, like in the woods. Yeah, that's what that means. Yeah. And in the woods and also, you know, very apologetic. Sure. That's also yeah. part of it. Um, he born on Canada Day, my dad. Oh so, my goodness. That is a real Canadian. That's a real Canadian. Yeah. That's the vibe. So I'm half and half. I'm half American, half Canadian, and solidly grew up between the two. So you grew up in New York. What was that like? It was, you know, it was wonderful in so many ways. It was completely different than I would imagine growing up anywhere else would be. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, I was like fully moving myself around the street at, you know, 12, essentially, yeah. and like taking the subway and exposed to so many different people and so many different experiences um, and a lot of substances, certainly. Uh, I was not a not a good teenager um, in my parents' eyes. But um, yeah, it was really remarkable. I mean, it certainly informed what I do now in the sense of this like yeah. bringing together of so many dis disparate sources of inspiration. I'm just forever jealous of anyone who's lived in New York longer than a year because I never have. Mm -hmm. I feel like I could grow up there still. I could be a different person if I moved there. I think you could. I mean, also, it's you would have to become a different person because spatially you'd be crammed in. Um, and then you have to... I, I feel like it externalizes its people in a really cool way, right. that city. Because you have to go out of your house. Because your house is a shoebox. That's right. I've asked a few people this that have either grown up or lived extensively in New York. I think I want to retire, which I never will do, but I think I want to be an old person, like right smack dab in the middle of Manhattan, in a shoebox. Because you don't need anything yeah. when you're old. I think that's fabulous. I mean... As long as I can get up and down the stairs, I guess. Well, that's that would be good for you. <laughs> the mobility. Yeah. It's good for, good for your joints. <laughs> you know... I think that that's a wonderful idea because people really slag on New York and New Yorkers in the sense that, oh, it's really cold and people are really mean. But I think that that's just a perspective. Yeah. Um, you know, I found people to be extremely loving and caring and helpful and, um, you know, really look out for each other there, especially if you foster a community as you have to do anywhere. Yeah. Like you can't just expect people to show up and care for you. You have to give back. That's right. Yeah. All right. Here I go. I'm on my way. I got to figure out a retirement spot in Manhattan. I, I wish you well. <laughs> <laughs> so what was the, the very first spark of, of performing music or chasing music as either performance or a hobby or 
uh, even going to shows? Um, I always dreamed of being a musician as a kid. I would dream of performing for people and think of myself singing for people. And when I was young, I did, you know, I would put on plays and stuff for my parents with my sisters and friends. And I did play a bit of classical piano growing up, um, though I was a very bad student and wanted to learn like the most complicated songs by memory. I refused to read music. I just wanted to immediately be able to play Rachmaninoff piano concerto, <laughs> which you can imagine just didn't, didn't go too well. But I did have a piano teacher who at least tried and fostered that wonder in me, which went a long way. That's great. Wonderful. She was amazing. Canadian. Um, <laughs> but then, oh, you know, over the course of a life, like, we get worn down. And um, even as young kids, like you kind of start th these limiting beliefs pile up on you. And I started to become really afraid of singing and playing. Mm. I was um, a punk kid and growing up in the streets of New York City. So I went to loads and loads of shows and um, dreamed of being up on those those stages. Yeah. Um, and then I started in college secretly trying and i do say trying trying to teach myself to play guitar and sort of writing songs kind of but i i was still really afraid and i had this wonderful poetry mentor who at one point came up to me and said um so tell me what do you do when you're not like in school and i said oh i do this and i do that and she said no 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 that's not that's not what i'm asking for and i said well i secretly play guitar and I really want to sing. And she said, oh, that's what's going on. Your poetry is not, it's it's not poetry, it, they're songs, essentially. These are lyrics. Okay. And basically yeah. she was saying that my words, I was failing with when it came to poetry. I was failing at writing interesting, good poetry, but I was writing songs. Yeah. Um, and so that was sort of a spark, but then again, just like never let myself. And then um, I reconnected with one of the, my oldest friends on earth, who's Elvis Perkins, mm -hmm. um, a brilliant songwriter. And we, I mean, I'd known him since forever, my entire life, but we reconnected romantically and as very close friends. And a little ways into our relationship, he approached me and said that he wanted me to play bass in his band. And I was like, absolutely not. Like I've never- And you were just learning guitar or? I mean, I was like, bare, I don't think I, I would have not considered myself to be able to play guitar at that point. Right. I think I was clearly because he saw something in me, you know, we yeah. jam and play together and um, usually in sort of different instruments than guitar and bass. But he said specifically that he felt that I had this sense of rhythm that he really yeah. wanted on stage with him. And I was like, whoa, <laughs> I don't think I can. I'm just not going to be able to do that. But I loved him so much and I trusted him. And so I um, stopped, I from the time I was 12 years old, I was a super hardcore weed smoker, like high from the time I woke up until the time I went to sleep. Mm -hmm. And I, um, in order to play bass, I, I quit smoking weed. And this is actually one of my, oh, this will come back around, but I quit smoking weed because I had to learn these songs. Right, and yeah. Elvis's music is complicated. Yes, it is. Like they're weird chords. Yeah. And when you think it's going to go to a major, it goes to some strange minor chord that doesn't exist. It's like, uh, you know. Um, and so I ended up going on tour with him and um, still terrified to sing, though, like literally yeah. miming my backup vocals, actually. Um, Did the bass playing kind of come together? Yeah, I think so. I mean, I, I hope so. Yeah. Um, you know, I was not... I, at that point, I would say that I was really just delivering... I wasn't playing music. Yeah, right. I was just delivering what I needed to deliver, but it worked. Yeah. And then, um, a, you know, a couple of years later, uh, I mean, to be totally honest, what happened is that like I stumbled into a plant medicine ceremony mm -hmm. and, um, Elvis and I went in together. I thought that it was going to be to like save our relationship. We were on the rocks. I was like, Oh yeah, we're going to go in here. This is medicine's going to fix us. Mm -hmm. And um, it did the complete opposite. It split us up. Oh, wow. And it said to me that I needed to make a record. And I was like, oh, okay, I don't know what how I'm going to do this. 
And so I called our front of house or emailed our the longtime front of house who worked with the Cold War kids. That's how we actually met him originally right. was Elvis had toured um, toured with you guys at some point. The great and, Beeman. Um, the great Beeman, David Beeman. And I sent him these three like weird little demos that I had made and said, I think I'm going to... Um, I'd like to try and make like a really easy, small EP. Mm -hmm. And he said, come to St. Louis, we'll do it easy. We'll do it in a weekend. It'll be so fun. It'll be great. And God bless David Beeman. That ended up being nine months (laughs) of just absolute insanity because I, it opened something up in me. Yeah. And I just walked in there and I ended up making this sprawling, intricate, record that I was so intense about and methodical about and um and he you know shepherded it basically all the way through um and then that was that and then somehow that little thing caught caught a spark yeah and there I was however many years later you know playing on stage at the Bowery Ballroom where I'd seen my favorite people play and and that gives me chills to think about like I've been saying recently, especially with regard to this record and like the line, um, basically that I make music for my 14 year old self. I make music for that punk kid in the Walkman, in the subway in New York City. Yeah. Well, I'm glad you stuck with that nine months. I could also, I I could see it going another way, especially your first endeavor. You could have been like, fuck this. But you (laughs) you and Beeman did not do that. We did not do that. And it, part of it was because I knew going in that it just had to be me alone playing okay. all of It was everything. Oh, you alone? It was everything. Yeah. I played everything. Um, I made every sound on that record. And I think if I had had other people's input besides Beeman and like other people who worked in the studio, um, friends, that it could have gone the opposite way because I wasn't yet assured in my vision. Yeah. And that process was so necessary for me to then be able to come back with this record and have 60 people on it or right, however yeah. many and be able to say, this is what I want. And I know what I want, even if it doesn't sound quote unquote, correct. Right. You know? Yeah. And to this new record, uh, peacemaker, which is a, a beautiful sprawling sonic adventure. And I, I I'd like you to explain it, but for me, it's, the combination of your words and the and the music and the sonic experience clearly illustrates kind of a, a Western uh, landscape, but it's got a lot of Cormac McCarthy pain in there. I, I hate to sound cliche, but it's it's not cliche. Look it's, at my background. It's it's <laughs> uh, it, but there's beauty in all of that pain. Um, and I'm just kind of wondering, Shades, your last your first record. It, it is, for me, it's different. Shades is a really beautiful record. The thing that stands out on Peacemaker is that there is a ferocity in this. And I'm just wondering where that came from, how you made that shift, because it's significant. I, I dug pretty deep into both records. And, and to be honest, at first I was like, oh, okay, I see this style. But then it's, it's a lot emotionally different for me. And... Um, just kind of wondering where you were when you started writing this Peacemaker. Yeah, I mean, it's interesting you say that. I think a great interview that I did toward the end of the touring cycle with Shades, someone said that in the course of, you know, performing these songs, I'd gone from Dido to Medea. Right. You know, like great. Mytho- mythologically. And, <laughs> yeah, and especially with the end of that, um, the end of Shades, you know, where it's like, don't go please don't go. And there's that weeping sense. I mean, um, I don't know, maybe it's the stages of grief. Maybe I moved, maybe it's part of that. It's like moving from grief, moving from this sadness into anger. Mm -hmm. You know, a lot was going on in my life. I I love that you bring up Cormac McCarthy. I can't remember if that's even in the press materials, but um, Blood Meridian was my favorite book growing up in high school. I wrote a really wild paper on it that definitely changed the trajectory of my my life in the sense of my like writing style and the way that I think about words. Um, and that sort of pretension, for lack of a better word, like this bigness and verbosity, yeah. which I can't escape from. That's me. Um, but 
Emotionally, yeah. You know, I went through a lot. Shades came at a really difficult time in my life. And Peacemaker, too. I mean, a lot of those songs were actually written before. Um, or not a lot of them, but some of the key ones, like Instrument of War, which I consider to be this, like the thematic centerpiece of the record, mm-hmm. even though it's the end. That was one of the earliest songs I ever wrote. And I tell people now, like, I don't think I'd have the balls to write a song like that now. That squarely comes from beginner's mind and sure but you know i've always had this sense this like i was born with this rage in my body as a kid i was an angry kid but i wasn't allowed to express it Mm -hmm. as many you know we're not really allowed to express anger we didn't we don't learn how to healthily express anger in in the west right really anywhere anymore um especially women and so i guess the process of singing has always been for me and making music a form of alchemy, essentially, of working with these emotions to be, to find a way to transmute them into something positive. And so I guess the emotion that I was really working with here was anger, and it was anger on my uh, personal anger. It was transpersonal anger. It was global anger. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um. You know, we've all been through so much. I mean, it's been four, I've been working on, I was working on this record essentially for, um, you know, through 2019 and even into 2020. Oh, okay. Um, Not like hardcore. We tracked most things uh, by the time that COVID hit, but still there was, you know, I was able to infuse some of that just what is going on into that, you know? Yeah. Yeah, and and it's funny. Uh, well, it's not funny, uh, but it it it's actually a, a positive thing. I was driving today, and um, I was you know thinking about talking to you, and there's something that's stuck with me. That's a John Lydon lyric, and it's I mm-hmm. think he, it may be the only lyric in the song, and he just says, "Anger <laughs> is an energy," and I kind of caught on to that as a older teen, but. I took it in a pretty positive way, not even a pessimistic way, which yeah. I also think pessimism can be positive too. But I'll just stick with anger for now. Um, but yeah, it, I, that's kind of what I, I latched on to, you know, as I was listening to uh, the record in the car today, that anger for sure is an energy, but I think just saying that can put some positivity to it. Yeah, I mean, I don't. Th- I'm not going to go down this because this is a deep rabbit hole but um (laughs) but there's this um something called like the scale of consciousness essentially and there's like scale of emotions it's a scale of emotions basically and where they vibrate Mm -hmm. very woo woo but anger is actually like higher up than you would think shame and guilt is all the way at the bottom of the emotional scale because they're repressed and so the worst possible human acts actually come out of shame and guilt, not necessarily right. anger, yeah. because at least anger is expressing. Right. And it's, if we are expressing and there's ways to do it that are not healthy and not positive, but if we are expressing, we're getting rid of it and we're, we're putting it somewhere else, as long as we're not putting it onto other people, um, it's being transmuted. Yeah. Yeah. You know? That's interesting. Yeah. And, and it, it can be a driving force for positive change. I sure. mean, anger is many times the driving force between the between the most uh, driving force behind the most positive change because something has to be, you know, it's the opposite of complacency in many yeah, ways. Yeah, right. The the other thing um, that I, that I kind of wonder if you're just conscious of this or if this just happens and if it, or it's part of your writing process, but you're your words and your lyrics, I kind of separate the two because mm-hmm. they have two effects, especially on this record, which they adjust the perspective. And you, as a storyteller, can bring someone in and your storytelling really locks in the listener. But also on this record, it's you get like a bird's eye view, again, of expansive landscape. But did that, did that just happen? Are you aware of that? 
or maybe you don't even feel that because you're subjective, but that is my experience with the record. It's you could zoom in and out depending on the piece you're listening to. Absolutely. I mean, I'm aware of it. I don't do it consciously in my yeah. writing. My writing really does pour out of me. Um, but I, especially on this record, I mean, it's very cinematic. It really is mm -hmm. like the, the scope of it. And I grew up watching a lot of movies and I grew up, you know, reading big fat novels yeah. that really do that. I mean, Moby Dick also, I mean, my list of books is so hilarious, but Moby Dick is also, you know, famously like this wildly expansive novel where like two of the most famous images from it are this, he talks about this bird's eye view, like how an eagle swoops through a valley and on the other hand, he'll go so far as to talk about the tiniest bone in the whale's yeah. body. And there's that sort of perspective shift. So I learned from these great novelists, for sure. Um, but also, I just, especially on this record, this theme kept coming up of framing. Okay. Um, prosceniums and camera angles. And I see music as well, not in a synesthetic sense, yeah. but especially in the way that I arrange it, it you know, things live in different spaces it's it's visual for me so i yeah. think that the lyrics mirror that well i'd like to play the line is that cool with you that's cool with me all right let's listen to it
another dynamic I just thought of is, especially both the singles that are out now, they really just, they slowly build. And by the end of both of these tunes, it's, it's on fire. <laughs> uh, and I, I really love that. And I didn't notice that at first, especially with the line. And, but there's just this, it's, it's pretty subtle. But then once you're aware of it, it's pretty energizing, I would say, the very least. Um, and so you tracked this in Nashville and you said with a bazillion people. Mm -hmm. Yep. How did you write this record? Did you go in with demos with people you don't know or, or did it did it mirror the, the way you did it with Beeman at all? This one was completely different. Okay. I mean, there were some songs that I had uh, had pretty extensive touring experience under my belt mm. uh, because I'd been touring these songs forever. Just songs that I didn't put on shades because I knew that I couldn't effectively deliver them yeah. essentially on my own. And so, but you know, fan favorites or whatever songs that I really had toured a lot. And so knew what I needed to sound. I didn't really have demos. I really, I had band recordings from the road basically, mm -hmm. um, but I didn't bring my touring band into the recording studio. I wanted it to be completely fresh and there to be absolutely no sort of attachment to what we'd done. So some of the songs were served as templates, okay. but it was important to me that nobody felt like, oh, th this is really important. This is my part and we need to do this. And it was totally fresh and new. And um, most of the songs were, the bones of them were tracked live. They were, so yeah. So what you I was hear there, you. like the bass, drums, and guitars were all tracked live in that song. And... I can feel that for sure. And I overdubbed the vocal on that one. And then the strings were overdubbed and the keys were overdubbed. Yeah, and... Yeah. I mean, without get, I we don't have to get too technical into, into the mix because mm -hmm. I don't know if it's the mix. Sometimes it's just the way you play it, and then you start stacking mm -hmm. instruments and words on onto a piece of music. But there's both crystal clarity to these songs, and that provides space in between what you hear. Which again, as you said a few minutes ago, it's really cinematically all tied together including just the mix almost and i again i don't know if it's the natural mix or you know i am psychotic about mixing all right absolutely psychotic i um so many relationships have very nearly been destroyed <laughs> <laughs> and um actually a number of people tried to mix this record uh -huh. and really did try and ended up coming back to me and being like, you have to do it, essentially. Um, so I worked with my partner and producing partner um, on this record, Kenneth Pattengale. He um, sat at the computer and made the moves and I was an absolute dictator wow. around him. And it was funny, I mean, even my, at, at the end, and I don't think they'll mind me sharing this, but at, like, when I signed my my record deal with City Slang, they came to me and they were like, okay, we absolutely love everything, but we want to remix the record. And I was Whoa. Like, good luck, guys. <laughs> like, good luck. This is like two and a half years. You should see the sessions. The Pro Tools sessions are maniacal. Yeah. I really should um, get fun. some screen screenshots of those so that you can see. Because I'm there, like the panning is that's what I, I mean Kenneth would do the moves but I would be there drawing the little things and I know nothing about I, I have no technical background right. in music um it's just pure intuition yeah. um so I'm really happy thank you for for bringing that up and I'm glad that you he hear clarity there because my goal with all of it is always to balance that clarity with that the blur I generally like when you don't know what an instrument is, unless it's like very clearly, oh, this is, these are the drums, you know, and you, we don't yeah. want to like muddy those too much. But when it comes to other stuff, I really like it to be this sort of fluid, this dance mm -hmm. and to feel like things come in and out and, and leave very specifically. And um, it's a full, 
full experience. Yeah, it is, especially with headphones. I did it on the plane this morning. Yeah, that's, I mean, I mixed them for, I mixed it for Apple headphones because yeah. I figured that is, you know, a lot of people listen to music that way. Right. And it then it's it's inside you. I wanted it to sound good when it's literally inside your your skull. Right. Yeah. You it worked. Um do you remember recording the hands? Oh that's my favorite song on the it's record. It's my favorite song. No one That's my favorite no song. No one's gonna this is gonna come out before the hands, so I'm listeners, so happy you brought that up. Oh God. I listened to it like just five times in a row. How sick is that arrangement so that song of course i remember recording first of all also one of the first songs i ever wrote i wrote that on piano in my old apartment in new york and um it was originally this kind of like rolling piano Mm -hmm. thing with this sort of sati-esque like stilted kind of like creepy igor vibe Mm -hmm. on the keys and then That was one of the songs that was rescued by my band. My touring band rescued a lot of these songs from the Mm. the trash can. Like I'm Lying was rescued by the drummer. Hands was rescued by Janie, my bass player, who said um, that it would be really cool as sort of a dub adjacent uh, song. Okay. And so we, we did that on tour. We never fully locked in on it though. Um, I, I listening back in the, in the studio before to try and find a good template for it. We never really locked in. Um, but I had this kind of idea and then we recorded that one and the absolute magic key to that song is Anthony DaCosta, who played a lot of the electric guitars on this Mm -hmm. record. He didn't play on the line, but, um, he came in with one of the, you know, the rubber bridge guitars that everybody plays now that Ruben makes here in LA. I you don't know, those, know guitars? those guitars. No, rubber bridge. You will see them. You will see them everywhere now. They're okay. rad. But he came in with a rubber bridge baritone. I want to say yeah. I might be wrong about that. And we did. We tracked it live three times, maybe. One of them was absolutely on fire. And then he went in and laid down what ever the hell is happening yeah. in that middle part. And um it's gorgeous. It's my favorite. It's my favorite thing on the I like I wish yeah. that I wish I could just go out and sell sell that to yeah. the people. There's you know? moments. <laughs> like, I mean I kind of visualize percentages of songs. Mm-hmm. I can remember around 75% what's going on in that song like right mm-hmm. now. You know? I love that. It's and it you feel like you're in there too, for sure. I love that. Yeah. You know what's also on that song, which was very was very validating for Kenneth, who he'd been dragging around. Um, it's kind of like an anvil. I don't know if it's an actual. It's like a giant pipe. Yeah. I don't even know. It's a huge iron thing. Yeah. And he'd literally been hauling it around his whole life. And I don't think he'd ever used it on a song. And then, of course... Me, I like to make my own percussion mm-hmm. and less, I did it less so on this record. And I was like, man, I miss my sounds. Yeah. I miss my, my tactility. And there was the old pipe. <laughs> and so I got to play the old <laughs> pipe on that song, uh. which is thrilling. Yeah. And my Echoplex came out, um, yeah. which was really exciting. Cause I'd purchased that on eBay and then, um, regretted it immediately. Cause I, it's, you know, it's like the proper one, and it was so finicky, and I oh, never could get it going. But it works beautifully on that yeah, song. Yeah, it does. Yeah, perfectly out of control. It's great. Well, you pulled it off. That's for sure. Thank you. <laughs> to say <laughs> I'm the so least. Glad. <laughs> um, I'm so glad my money wasn't wasted. Yeah, congratulations. This record is just incredible. Um, Thank you. I want to ask you, you said at the beginning that your teacher told you that you were writing lyrics more than poetry. Mm -hmm. Do you still write poetry? Do you have a different perspective on that whole thing? You know, I don't, I fall back into writing poetry. I really don't as much anymore. Um, I still read a lot of poetry and I engage with the world through the eyes of a poet, I think. Um, observationally and I really cherish 
what some would consider to be the mundane. Mm -hmm. And as more as the older and older I get, um, the more I'm really in awe and wonder of the, the little things that we take for granted. And that to me is, is poetry. Yeah. Um, but I need to get back into writing poetry. I think that I have a great book in me somewhere. Um, and I am thinking of one really cool poem I wrote that's very Cormac McCarthy, mm. actually. Um, but, you know, I don't know. We'll see. I have to write more songs yeah. first. So what's next? Are you going to gonna tour on this sucker? There will be touring. Mm -hmm. There will be playing, which is great. What about instrumentation? Yeah, I mean, obviously this is not the kind of record that's going to sound exactly the same live. Um, because I can't afford an orchestra. Yeah. And I can't play with tracks generally. Like right. I've just never been able to. I'm so fluid with time. I guess we can try. We can try mm -hmm. and do some tracks. But I'm hoping to do a few shows with strings for sure. I've strings, that's how I got started my very first show in this outfit, as as this um, you know. As, as Vera was um, a, a string quartet, me just in a oh, string really? quartet. And that was, yeah, an upright bass. Blue to Tiger on upright bass, she's now a superstar. And she was the first person to play bass for my songs, which is super cool. And uh, yeah, I mean, I don't know. I'd love to play strings. I like playing solo. Oh, you do? Um, I do. Yeah. I pack a lot of power. My actual... My, my guitar technique doesn't even really come through on this record, but I play very specifically and um, and uniquely. And I really like surprising people with with the power of just me on stage. Yeah. But um, I think Kenneth and I are going to do some duo guitar stuff, which will be rad. Yeah. And yeah, and then we'll have some full band for sure. Cool. Got to got to get Anthony. I have to call him and get him on board now so he can play that hand solo. That's right. Just live. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right. Well. When you um, get out there, travel safe. Thank you. And congratulations again. This record is fantastic. It comes out the day after my birthday, February Great. 2nd, 2024. Happy birthday. Yeah, thank you. Thanks for making a record and releasing it right after my birthday. Well, thanks for <laughs> giving it some airtime. Sure, of course. Giving me some a reason to talk about it and with such for such wonderful questions they yeah. aren't all wonderful questions oh. when you go out and do these things you know oh thank you i appreciate that i'm trying um doing great okay well take care of yourself and thanks again it was nice to talk to you nice to talk to you too thank you so much joe all right bye 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 Across the grass, say it's the sidewalk. Exit the window, swear it's the door. Bend down the ceiling, watch as I crawl along the floor, the floor. I trust what you say Just get it together And it's all okay Piss on my back Tell me it's rain Then expect me to stay But I've wasted nights Waiting for the sun You said would rise and I've gone for days Knowing the night would fall again Again You tell me you love me At least that's what you say Swear I